Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Shakun. Um, and like we always end up bringing somebody really interesting, and we have someone who's amazing, especially right now, while the entire world is going through COVID-19. Uh, we have someone called Andrew Parry, who is the executive director of Sexual Assault Awareness LLC. And right now, because the situation is so bad, and a lot of people have been stuck with their assaulter, uh, we thought that this is a very good opportunity to talk about um, what is happening in the world, what needs to be done, what kind of support we need. And, and yeah, so thank you so much, Andrew, for being here. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I would like to start with, uh, you know, knowing more about your organization. What does sexual awareness, assault awareness does? Mm -hmm. And we can go from there. So uh, basically, it's, it's a psychotherapy and training organization, um, and, uh, which is really just me. I'm the executive director and lecturer and psychotherapist and all of that. Um, and I've been doing sexual assault recovery work with girls and women for uh, probably about 25 years. Um, but I came up with sexual assault awareness maybe 10 years ago, not quite, um, because I had started to take some of my ideas into a more national platform. Um, I had been talking for many years about the experience that many women have in experiencing orgasm or sexual assault. And it's on top of everything else that girls and women go through in a sexual assault, which creates a lot of shame, a lot of anxiety and depression and, and all the symptoms that we know about. You know, if you do a little bit of research about um, rape trauma syndrome, you know those things. But what most people or many people don't know is that for many women, the experience of having some kind of an arousal response during it uh, adds a whole other level of magnitude of anxiety, depression, shame, all the same symptoms. So, uh, so it would come up with my clients a lot and I would talk with them a lot. And I didn't realize for many, many years that this wasn't common knowledge. I thought, oh, anyone who does trauma work, sexual assault trauma work knows this. And years ago, I was talking to a uh, female colleague and talking, I was uh, co consulting with her about a, a, a treatment dilemma I was having. And this woman I respect, and I was talking about this, and I mentioned that the, this client um, uh, had been raped at a party and she had had an arousal response. And my, uh, my colleague insisted, well, well, that's the problem. Uh, on a deep level, she really wanted it to happen. So she had that response. And I started questioning, like, if this someone who I respect and who's, you know, someone in the field that I know could say something like that, um, you know, and I started talking about the arousal response, and she really didn't understand what I was talking about. And it sent me on a sort of deep dive back into all of the literature and the textbooks that I had read in studying about and learning about sexual assault treatment and trauma and realizing almost none of them said a word about arousal, the arousal response can't be the only one who knows about this. That doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but there wasn't really any information out there, uh, little bits and pieces. So it wasn't unknown, but it wasn't really being talked about. It certainly wasn't being talked about. I went on to a large social media platform and I just put the information out there and said, I'm a psychotherapist. I do this kind of work. And here's an experience that many women have. Um, and just opened it up for discussion. And that discussion blew up and became, to date, I think the largest online discussion about rape, sexual assault, women's rights. I mean, there's so many pieces that came out of that discussion. Um, and what usually would have been a two to three hour talk uh, ended up going on for several weeks because I kept going back and answering questions, and fielding discussions and so forth. Um, and from that, I started getting invited to speak at conferences. And that was, like I said, almost 10 years ago. Um, and so at this point, I've spoken for multiple psychological conferences and agencies and women's rights and women's law uh, conferences, all different kinds of things, just not only around the U.S., but around the world. Um, and I've come to realize that there are other professionals who certainly know about this, but the only other person I know who publicly talks about this to any extent is a Canadian uh, sex educator. She's not a therapist, um, uh, Emily Nagowski, and uh, she's talked about this. 
Um, so I, I've uh, been referred to as the American in me, I don't know. Um, but I keep getting invited to do these talks. And out of that, I started to tackle more and more kind of challenging or taboo topics that come up. Um, and so kind of relevant to Tickle Life is a lot of women who have, have a history of sexual assault or who have been raped sometimes develop sexual interests or desires or fetishes or kinks or whichever phrase you'd like to use out of that. Again, sometimes very painful, very shameful. They can be compulsive. Um, and again, they're not really talked about. There is almost no research about this. And so just in the last, I'm going to say two to three years at this point, I've started to make it my mission to try and bridge this gap between what I call the professional world, the more conservative world of sexual assault, education and training, and the BDSM and kink world, where I think there is a lot of kind of, I'll call it layman's knowledge uh, or experiential knowledge of these things happening but they don't understand the psychological piece of it. And so there's a lot of re-wounding and re-traumatizing that happens in those circles. Um, and so most recently I've started to do research um, and present about women who experience sexual assault and then go on to develop some of these kinks and fetishes um, and how to work with them in a clinical way. And so I'm looking at developing treatment models and so forth. So long answer to your question. <laughs> um, I remember the last time when we were talking, you did discuss about working with security forces. And that, yeah, was the military. Very, very, that, that was something very interesting. And I would love, like, you know, if you can tell our users about it. Well, military sexual trauma is a very real, very prevalent thing in the military, in all militaries. I mean, I've worked with U.S. military, but, you know, certainly. I think it's easy to say anytime you get a large group of men together um, and a few women, there's going to be um, sexual assault that happens um, and there needs to be more protections and advocacy and uh, knowledge put in place about that. There's nothing wrong with women serving in the military, obviously, um, but they need to be protected uh, and male on male as well. Um, it's a big specialty, but it certainly happens. Um, but um, so um, I've done a number of trainings on sexual assault prevention or talking about these kind of taboo and challenging topics, helping a SART, a sexual assault response team coordinators or SHARP, which is military's kind of sexual assault team that responds to those things when they come up and doing trainings with them um, on how to understand better and how to mitigate um, those things when they come up. And, and these are largely, uh, usually not therapists. Uh, they're usually military folks who are interested in and then have some level of training in how to respond to someone who's been sexually assaulted. So it's basically to add to their knowledge base. So they'll bring me in to do that kind of thing. And I think that is also important because if, if they would not understand, then how, you know, the, the, the system would change. Yeah. Yeah. No, and again, just in the last you know, maybe half a decade, the idea of military sexual trauma, even though it's been known about for a long time, has gotten a lot more attention and focus. Uh, and so I think they're more willing to bring in experts and speakers to be able to educate and address these things than they were, you know, a handful of years ago. Um, you know, there's, um, um, there's, a, there's this uh, Facebook group that I'm part of. It's, it's something to do with narcissists. Mm -hmm. uh, and people have been posting their incidences and their uh, you know, experiences while being in, in a relationship with, with someone. And there is like, you know, they are talking about assault, actually. And a lot of them are actually, you know, like when you read them, read the incidences, you realize that a lot of them are not talking about, you know, people getting physical with them. It's also mental. It's also emotional. Right. So how as a person... Um, so, okay, so like somebody that I know very close, I know that she's mentally assaulted. Mm -hmm. but when you talk to her, she says, you know, he's never raised his hand. So maybe the problem is me. Mm. You know, and you must be experiencing that a lot as well, you know, with your patients. So, so what is the kind of advice you would give somebody like this? Uh, leave. <laughs> which, is, which is a way too easy answer. Yeah. Um, but I think starting to educate yourself about all the forms of abuse. Um, 
when I'm working with someone in a domestic violence situation or who starts to raise those kinds of things. And maybe they were sexually assaulted. They may have a family history of being treated a certain way, not physically abused or sexually abused, but emotionally, psychologically, um, and almost in a sense groomed for what happened later because mentally, psychologically, they were so beaten down that they didn't have the resources, not that they need to have the resources because rape is always the, uh, the fault of the perpetrator. Um, but to, but there is something about um, having been uh, abused psychologically, mentally, you know, to a higher incidence of sexual assault later on. Um, there's a, uh, I want to say a well-known study because it's well-known in the field, which is uh, stands for adverse childhood experiences. Are you familiar with this? Yeah. Um, and, and basically what it says simply is when we go through a lot of bad things in childhood, we are set up for a lot of bad things happening to us later uh, in life. Relationship issues, health issues, medical, uh, psychological problems happen later because of bad things that happen in childhood. It seems like a, a real easy connection to make. Um, but you know, when they started the study in the 90s, there really wasn't a connection made. And it's very much a mind-body connection if you look at it that way, that you know, what happens to us when we're young affects us systemically, affects our physiology, affects the way we look at the world and view the world and allows us to be in more painful situations, adverse situations later on, including abusive relationships. Um, but so I think education, uh, you know, to me, that's always the answer is we need more knowledge, we need more information, we need more people to know the things that not just I know, but people in the field know, so that they can recognize whether it's happening currently, or they can recognize that they see that coming towards them. But that kind of coercive, manipulative, verbal control is very real, uh, very damaging. Um, in fact, we do have some studies indicating that psychological, emotional abuse is uh, potentially more damaging than physical. Um, and I've worked with so many girls and women who have told me, you know, I, I would rather have been uh, beaten or assaulted than the psychological torture that I was put through because it made me question who I am and, and doubts about myself, at least if I was spanked or hit or even sexually abused, I could put that into a category of this thing that happened. Yeah. So, um, you know, now, now like, like we started with COVID-19, there are a lot of people or a lot of women, even men, who, who, have been, who have been stuck together, you know, with their abuser. So yeah. it is a bad situation, you know, and there's no going out of it. But as a therapist and as someone who's been working with them, what is the advice that you will give them? I think staying connected outside of the home as much as you possibly can. Stay connected to friends, stay connected to family. Use media like Zoom or Skype, uh, phone, good old fashioned phone calls, um, uh, emails, any way that you could stay connected to the world outside of the house, I think is a lifeline um, to one, having outside opinions and ideas about what's going on in the home if you are feeling um, Best in some way, uh, and I have I have a very great concern about what's happening now. I've um, I put out into my community that I'm available for additional sessions, additional um, psychotherapy um, around those issues. They could go to school, they could see a counselor, they can do something. Now a lot of those avenues have been cut off. Um, fortunately, I will say that the wider sexual assault and domestic violence community is very well aware of these concerns. There's a lot of information out to be found in the world. There's a lot of organizations putting information out with tips and ideas about um, how to how to get through in that situation. So there's um, you know, there's domestic violence councils, there's RAIN, uh, which is the, um, uh, the national uh, sexual assault hotline here in the US and globally. Uh, so there's a number of organizations addressing this. So that's, that's actually, <laughs> that, that's good. 
um, because otherwise they'll be in the, like, oh, I can't even imagine, you know, it's scary thinking about it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, and, and for someone who, you know, maybe just be, be at the beginning of an abusive relationship and not aware, kind of as you were saying a few minutes ago, not seeing or aware of the signs, it's an opportunity for an abuse. Um, they're trapped in the house, communications cut off. Uh, so to even step up uh, control and abuse, it's, you know, it's a, it's a perfect opportunity for an abuser or perpetrator to uh, move further down that road. And so more important for there to be those external connections with family, with friends, with organizations. So I have a last question. Mm-hmm. How has it changed Andrew as a person? while working with, you know, people who have gone through abuse, uh, working with security forces, being a speaker, how it made a change into who you are right now or who you were before? You know, I I get asked that question a lot when I do um, talks, especially because of the nature of the work that I'm I'm willing to go to some very dark places. um, And I think it's important. uh, motto slogans is ending shame and ending stigma and i think shame is the root piece of sexualized violence um largely because shame is so closely connected to sex in general even pleasurable enjoyable sex and so anything connected to something sex like like sexual abuse then becomes this very shameful painful thing i think if we can open that up and say there's no shame here we have to be able to talk about it openly with each other uh, and whatever it is you're thinking, feeling, experiencing, doing, enjoying, uh, that there's room to talk about that. Um, so I, I, I say that because, um, like I said, I get asked this question a lot. And I know there's a lot of concern about like burnout in my field. Yeah. Um, the thing I keep going back to is when I'm sitting with someone in the depths of their pain and talking about horrific experiences that they've been through, whether it was childhood sexual abuse or gang rape or being raped at a party or whatever it was, I get to help them. I get to work with them through this most difficult part of their life and into something better, into helping them see that that recovery is possible, into helping them start to shine some light on those painful situations and realize it's not as scary as I thought. I get to witness that process. And so just the opposite of being burned out, I'm buoyed up by that. Um, I, I get to witness and experience the healing piece of it um, and be a part of that. So to me, that is an incredibly, it's a gift that I get to have as a psychotherapist um, and the trust and safety that the girls and women that I've been working with for so many years that they place in me to do that work with them is, sorry, um, it means a lot to me. It's invaluable. Um, I mean, I, I, the, the work is what's important, but um, I'm able to keep doing it because I keep my focus on the positive that comes out of it and the healing that comes out of it. Wow. <laughs> Really nice. But thanks so much, Andrew. Um, how can people connect with you? Like, where can they find uh, you? Through my website, um, saawareness.com, which stands for Sexual Assault Awareness. Um, and, and I chose that name. I created that name because I thought, uh, oh, this is going to be, there's Sexual Assault Awareness Month, Sexual Assault Awareness Activities. You know, it's a, it's a popular phrase. And I thought, oh, there's you know, some organization out there. And when I went to look for uh, the URL and the company name, yeah. no one had it. Uh, so it was a number of years. Ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I picked it up. So that's uh, my social media is all sexual assault awareness. Um, so I'm on Twitter as at sex assault aware on Instagram as well, if you look up sexual assault awareness, you'll find me, but it's like at sexual assault aware. It's a little bit different for you. It doesn't matter. We'll put it in the bio. <laughs> yeah, it, and it's all, it's all on the website. Um, so that's one way. And the other is, um, honestly, to call me. Um, I have a, I don't know if you want me to give a phone number out here, but the number is on my website. Um, and it's important to me to stay in contact with the, the people I work with. Uh, fortunately, uh, in the years I've been doing this, people have been respectful, so I'm not getting calls at 
three, four in the morning for the most part, unless it's like an emergency or something. Um, but, um, but I'm happy to be available to, to my community and larger. Um, I do also want to throw out, I do teletherapy. Um, and so because I do so many like national, international conferences, oftentimes women will approach me afterwards and ask if I'll work with them. And as long as it is legal in the country, the state where they are, I will do that. Um, I'll usually do that research and make sure it's okay. Yeah. Um, but I see, I see people internationally um, as well as here in my hometown in Los Angeles County. That's, that's really good because I know that we do have a lot of viewers and uh, you know people who come, people who send us messages and they are talking about a song. So this might help someone and that's, that's the goal of Tickle.life also. Let's, let's create the movement. Let's bring everybody together. So thank you so much, Andrew. It was lovely. I hope we can do one more uh, very soon. But please take care. Uh, oh, I'd love to hear about uh, sex work and other aspects of the work that I do. There's so much to go into. Yeah, yeah. We will we'll surely do it um, one of these days. And now mm -hmm. I think like because everybody's working from home, so I think yeah, we all have opportunity of creating a lot of content. Right, right. So, but do well, take care of Thank you so much, Shakun, for having yeah. me on. Thank you so much. Um, see you soon. All right. Take care.